When I moved in, there was an odd panel on the wall, measuring about four inches by four inches. The panel didn't match the rest of the grungy yellow wall surface surrounding it. It had a circle at center, and various angles and curves radiating outwards from there. The design was created in a pale blue and foam green. I got the impression that it had been darker before. That over the course of time, it had faded. I had only moved into that tiny apartment in the city because I had gotten a few jobs in a local film industry, and living close was a major leg up on the other candidates for work. I wish now I had looked over that place a bit before moving in, but really I would figured I'd only be there for a month at most. Then I'd have enough work to pay for a real apartment. It's not that I expected to live in luxury, it's just that I never intended to live in filth like this. It wasn't the panel either. This place stank of ancient sweat and unspeakable body odor. The appliances were shit. And so were the utilities. The lights would randomly go out, even if they were brand new. And even one exploded in a hail of sparks the moment I flicked it on. Both the kitchen and bathroom drains would clog consistently. Early on, I fished out a wad of old, half-degraded toilet paper. From the sink, I mean. The first few nights, I stayed as late as I could. Danced. Partied. Spent all that money I thought I intended to live on until I got that big break. Anything to avoid going back to that awful, depressing hovel. When I did return, I'd be too drunk to care where I was. That I made sure of. I'd fall into bed, or on the floor, or on the ficus I brought to line up the oppressive mood of the place. The ficus was a recipient of much dishonor during those drunken nights. So I could only assume the poor, bedraggled thing had grown accustomed to it. So I was drunk. That's pretty much why I didn't think of anything of it the first time I heard that noise. Squeak. Squeak clank. I think I popped an eye open, muttered profanity, and pulled a blanket, uh, the rug over myself. The next morning, that bastard called the sun woke me by staring through the broken window blinds. I groaned, complained, and begged the daylight to extinguish itself. I barely noticed what had changed. It wasn't until I shambled towards the kitchen, head throbbing, that I saw the small intruder. A note. It was a slip of paper rolled up into tube shape, fixed across the middle by a single red rubber band. Figuring that this was my own doing, some half-remembered note to self hastily scribbled out before my brief coma, I ignored it and went about my usual routine. Made hangover cure that did nothing. Spent a time spent sitting quietly with eyes closed. Vowed to God that I'd never do so much as touch a bottle of conserve again. And so on. As I unfurled the note, I could immediately see it wasn't my handwriting. It was legible. Cut palm left hand from base of pinky finger to base of thumb in a smooth motion. I had seen a lot of movies. Read a lot of scripts. Hell, I've been in movies. This wasn't one of them. So I didn't laugh. I didn't ball it up and throw it away. I didn't roll my eyes and deliver some self-referential dipshit monologue about how this was obviously a joke. Why? Right beneath the clearly written plain-looking text. Or else. No, my mind didn't jump at to the idea it was a joke. I was afraid. Someone had obviously gotten into my room while I was sleeping. And instead of taking anything or just killing me, they decided to do something much more disturbing. They left a demented command. I placed a note on the floor where it had been and backed away carefully surveying everything around me. Luckily, there was nowhere to hide in my sparse living space. Hello, 
I called out, because psycho killers always gladly answer you, right? I poked my head out the front door slowly and peered into the dank, moldering hallway. No one there. Nothing out of the sorts. I sat at the dining room table, a plastic patio table, really, and studied the paper again. The words, or else, were there out in red ink, while the rest appeared to be jotted out with standard pen. I was halfway reading through the words again when the lights went out. As I looked up, and before I let out a curse, the lights rose once more. It wasn't unusual, yet. When I started reading again, and again the lights went out, then on, then off, on, off, on, off. The bulb over my head exploded, sending a shower of sparks and glass down on my head and onto the page. For a moment, I had thought the glass cut me. There the crimson spread on the note, but it was sweeping out in a cryptic threat written thereupon. Or else, was quickly smearing itself across the page, releasing a copper odor of human blood. I dropped the paper and bolted to the door. I rattled the doorknob, twisted and turned it, threw myself against the door's hard surface, but it wouldn't budge. It's nothing. I reasoned myself in that deftly quiet moment. The lights above me quickly dimmed and brightened of their own accord once more. It's nothing. Just a cut. I took the kitchen knife and drew it across the palm of my flesh, pinky to thumb, now releasing my own very real blood to roll in rivets along my wrist and forearm. It was a superficial wound, to be sure. I wasn't that committed to the act. The flickering stopped immediately, as soon as a nice cold tip reached the base of my thumb. At that moment, the injury simply itched. But within seconds, I knew that would change. I grabbed a bag of frozen peas in the hand and gripped it tightly as I once again walked to the front door. I flung it open with ease. No problem. The phone rang. For a moment, I stood in the doorway and looked back to the telephone. I knew in that moment that one of those choices was a proper one. Leaving and being free of whatever just occurred, or answering the phone and averting some other disaster that was awaiting me. Thinking quickly, with a touch of genius, if I may claim so. I moved to the ficus in position to prop the door open. I answered the phone. Hello? It rang. I mean, I could hear ringing, as if I placed a call myself. Nick Mirak and Associates. The woman on the other end chirped. It was my talent agency. Uh, hey. I stammered. Sorry. I dialed the wrong number. Excuse me? I dialed wrong. Sorry about that. Well, why not? Her response didn't match what I was saying. She continued. Well, this isn't much of a notice. We don't have much time now to... Excuse me, I don't like your tone. Okay, that's fine. I'll let Mick Miller know how you feel. Goodbye. She slammed down the phone. She was pissed. I hadn't even said anything. It sounded like she was having a conversation with herself. I held with the phone and lifted it again, dialing the agency back. We're sorry, your call cannot be completed as dialed. Please hang up the phone and try again. It was an automatic voice, no different than the one I had heard hundreds of times before, until it added something, or else. The line went dead. Upon hearing this, no less cheery and professional than the rest of the message, I immediately slammed down the receiver and let go as if it was about to catch fire. I felt my hands, my face, going numb. I felt cold and knew it wasn't the room. It was me. I had been adequately terrified and now stood erect, only by grace and muscle memory. I stared at the phone until I heard the familiar noise. Squeak! Squeak-clank! 
I whirl around, expecting to catch the sight of some home invasion madman to finally end my confusion with a hatchet to the brain. Instead, upon the floor, right under where the brother had been, was a plain-looking note, rolled up, fixed with a red rubber band. I understand, I said, only half understanding. If I don't play your stupid game, you'll screw me over. I stormed over to the note and then stopped just short of it. Well, maybe I don't care what you do. Nothing out of the ordinary happened in response to my defiance. That's right. Don't say anything. Don't show your face. Whatever. Nothing. I was free to go. I could walk it right out the front door and into the streets. I could go to the talent agency and make up some bullshit excuse, like my friend called them pretending to be me and... I was free to go if I choose. That's what scared me most of all. Proceed to window. Apply pressure to mounted air conditioning unit. Until wall mounted air conditioning unit falls free from window. Or else. This one. I crumbled into a ball and threw away. Only because the door was open a few steps away. I moved quickly to the door without incident, and stepped into the hallway. My phone rang again. I laughed at first, because it seemed like a pathetic repeat of a failed tactic. Then I thought it over. Three rings. Four rings. Who's going to pick up? The agency. Five rings. Six rings. What if it was a call from my girlfriend? Seven rings. What if whoever... Whatever this was. Call the police and somehow turn me in for something. I rushed back to the phone just to hear what I have to undo later on. Hello? Hello, can you hear me? What do you mean? No, she couldn't hear me, my mother. Honey, what are you saying? Are you crying? What do you mean? No, please, there's so much to live for. Please wait. No! I listened in like a silent voyeur as my mom tried to talk me out of killing myself. The air conditioner was loose. It was easy enough to force it out, especially with momentum I'd gained by running straight for it as soon as I dropped the phone. It landed on the sidewalk with a tremendous clatter, breaking into pieces and sending bits of stone flying. The pedestrians alone were spared a gruesome fate, merely by the fact they hadn't been standing directly beneath it. I only looked out long enough to see I hadn't killed anyone. Then I was back to the phone and almost immediately, Hello? Mom? Where'd you go? Please, don't do anything crazy. Can you hear me? Yes! Yes, I can hear you! Please! She was in tears. But at least I, the real me, was talking to her this time. Mom, it's okay. I couldn't think of anything else to say. I... I have a part where I play this guy who kills himself. I just wanted to convince you. Silence. A final, sickened groan. A sound of disgust and anguish you never want to hear from anyone you love. And she hung up on me. I probably could have thought of a better lie, but not under these circumstances. There was going to be some serious collateral damage. I didn't know how if I could patch up things. If she'd hear me go through with it. If she'd hear a gunshot or slicing flesh. Or however I'd do myself in. That would have been something completely inexplicable and unforgivable. This time, I caught it when it happened. Squeak! Squeak clank! The panel. The one that didn't belong. Circle at center slid to the side, revealing a small, dark opening that quickly snapped shut. But only after another tube-shaped note had passed through. I tried to catch it before it closed, but I missed it by a mile. I couldn't work the thing open with my fingernails or any sort of utensils. It was like the panel was one smooth, interrupted surface, with nothing hidden behind. How long is this gonna go on? I shouted directly at the offending square. What's the point? I sat by the panel, holding the same knife that I had drawn blood with, and I rolled the latest communication. Retrieve a human being. 
or else. I laughed. It wasn't the sort of laugh you'd expect. It was like a sudden cough. Retrieve a human being? Unbelievable. The first two actions, well, disconcerting, had been simple enough. This, however, sounded quite like kidnapping. I turned to the panel again. Again, I spoke directly into it. No way. I got up, placed a knife on the table by the door, and left. The phone rang, and I ignored it. Call the agency. Call my mother. Call the president himself. It was nothing I couldn't explain away somehow. Even if they didn't believe me, it'd still be better than taking my chances. It was only when I got into the hallway I realized my mistake. The panel. The wall. Someone feeding. In notes. But who? I backtracked, past my own propped open door. Continue ignoring the pleading rings of the phone. And proceeded into the apartment next to mine. The one that shared my wall and was home to whoever was messing with me. Who is it? A woman's voice from within. I wondered, in that moment, how she'd be able to imitate my voice, enough to convince my own mother. No. There had to be someone else in there. A man. Probably someone who rigged my lights and patched into my phone. Who is it? She insisted. Your new neighbor! I called back, figuring there was no use in hiding it. I know what you've been doing! The door just opened a tad. The chain caught logging it. The chain lock caught it. A young woman, blonde, petite, peeked out at me. No doubt doing her best to keep me from seeing whoever else shared the apartment and what he was doing. What? She pretended to be confused. The panel. I smiled. I know what you're doing with the panel. And the phones. And the lights. And I'm pretty sure the police are going to want to know, too. A pause. Was she trying to figure out what I meant? Or think of a lie? You're insane. She slammed the door in my face. I stared at the people. I knew she was watching me. Watching me, watching her. The phone continued to ring. And ring. And ring. And ring. I threw my shoulder against the door. Saying the chains link flying like beads snatched from a necklace. The girl had been behind the door, as I presumed. And so she too toppled to the ground. She sprawled out on the floor on her back, before quickly rolling over and crawling towards her own telephone like a cockroach fearing the light. Uh-uh. I scolded her as I grabbed her by the waist. Nice try. She fought at first, but soon saw there was no use. What do you want? Please, take anything. Just don't. Relax. I just want to know who's been passing notes through. If it's not you, then tell me who is. Which room is he in? I'm only going to talk to him. There's nobody here! I checked, dragging her along with me, turning her arm so any wrong move would cause her pain. I looked into every room. So it's you, then? I smirked. Okay, now tell me how you did everything. I don't know what you're talking about! Right. Then why is my phone still ringing? What? My phone. Stop ringing it. That's enough. I'm not calling you. My phone's right over there. You have something. A cell phone or... Don't touch me! No! No! I talked to her about the panel, went over it again and again. But all she did was claim she had nothing to do with it. I escorted her through the hallway to the panel in question. I kicked the ficus over, 
spilling it across the floor. It slammed the door behind us. She knew she wouldn't be getting away that easily. There! I pointed. See? Now you can't deny it. She stared at the thing for a couple moments, then turned to me. Fear in her eyes. Fear at being punished somehow. Fear at being punished now that she was caught. No doubt. Squeak! Squeak clank! Both of us turned the panel in disbelief. There, at my feet, was another note. Exactly the same as before. How are you doing this? I shouted in her tear-streaked face as I shook her violently. How? I threw her to the floor and picked up the note. Pulled the rubber band. I pulled the rubber band so roughly that it snapped, lashing my hand. I'm rolling the note with fury. I had to turn it a few times before finding which end was up. While I was distracted, the girl made for the door, sobbing, screaming. She tried to open it, but could not. As I understood it, no one could open it. Now. The room began to heat up. Quickly. The temperature rose until sweat drenched us both, and the walls began to blister. The phone was still ringing. And silently, I wondered how many people had been called. What I had threatened. What I had confessed to. Hotter. Hotter. Hotter, the room grew. I had no doubt that soon we'd both be dead. Unless... What's going on? She demanded, positively mad. What the fuck are you looking at? There, on the page, were two diagrams. The first diagram showed the outline of an average woman. This is how the human being is arranged. The second diagram showed a similar outline, with limbs rearranged, misplaced, cut off at different lengths and reattached at odd directions. Helpful arrows guided each number limb to its new location. This is how a human being will be arranged. Or else.